So, you know, even in the lifetime of the apostles, the question of who Christ was and what his nature is began to be misunderstood, right? We can see from the apostle John's writings, his gospels, his letters, even the book of Revelation, that he focuses a lot on this question of who God or who Christ was, what his nature was, you know, trying to help us understand more about it. You know, even the gospel of John begins with the well-known scripture of, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, right? So starting off, he starts off with this focus on what the nature of Christ, or yeah, what the nature of Christ was and who Christ was, what the fullness of him was. And so while understanding who Christ is and what his nature is a very large topic, today I just want to look at one small aspect of it. And specifically what I want to look at is a few key proof scriptures that we can know to see that Christ is the God of the Old Testament, right? He's the being who talked with, walked with the men and women of the Old Testament. And it's interesting, I, I spent a decent amount of time as I was preparing this, reading what other people, you know, other uh, churches and other beliefs were in who the God of the Old Testament was. And there's actually a fairly wide-ranging, you know, set of beliefs. One of the earliest misunderstandings came during the time of John, right? So the Gnostic teachings that he wrote a lot against was that the God of the Old Testament was this separate being from God the Father and Jesus Christ. And a lot of the re rationale that they had was because the God of the Old Testament was harsh and cruel and mean and just couldn't be this loving God that Christ talked about and couldn't be kind of the loving person that Christ was on earth. <clears throat> and then even today, you know, Gnosticism for the most part is not around, but even today, when you look at Trinitarians or Unitarians, most people, or a lot of people, believe that the God of the Old Testament was the Father, right? And again, a lot of this rationale of why it's the Father is down to this uh, misunderstanding that the God of the Old Testament was harsh or cruel or mean. And so, in a lot of ways, it's Christ came to almost protect the people from the Father, right? He came to be that buffer between, bu between the Father and the people, and that a lot of it had to do was, uh, with this harsh and cruel nature, right? So when we look at it that way, or if you thought that way, a lot of the things that we believe, a lot of the fundamental beliefs that we have just don't fit well with that understanding of this harsh and cruel God. So it's important for us to understand that the God of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ, right? That there's a continuation of what was happening in the Old Testament and the New Testament. That it was this one being who was interacting with the people and that there is a unity between these two scripture or between these two parts of the Bible. So what are the proofs that Christ is the God of the Old Testament, right? And this is what I want to look through. There are many, but I want to look at just kind of three of the primary ones. So the first one that I want to look at, and what I'll do in each of these proofs is I'll look at a set of scriptures in the Old Testament, and then I'll look at where Christ in the New Testament is basically declaring that he is this God. So the first one, and, and in some ways this is probably the most uh, clear one, is we see Christ declaring that he was the I am, right? And so if we turn back to Exodus 3, we can see uh, where this I am is interacting with, with Moses. So in Exodus 3, 13, it says, Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers have sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to him? And then in verse 14, it says, And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So we see here that the God of the Old Testament, the one who's talking to Moses, says very clearly that his name is I am, right? He's I am who I am. So we can see in the New Testament that Jesus clearly says he is this I am. So in John 18, 4, it begins, 
It says, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them. So this is when the Jews came to uh, arrest him and ultimately crucify him. So it says, went forward and said to them, whom are you seeking? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And then Jesus said to them, I am. And a lot of uh, Bibles add, I am he. But when you look at this, what he's saying is, he's saying, I am. He's saying, I am this person who Moses talked to. And it goes on to say, and Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with him. And now when he said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. And the reason why they fell to the ground is because what he was declaring to them was he was their God. He was the God of the Old Testament. And so for them, this was, you know, very, they were taking him very aback because he was declaring that he was God in the flesh to them. He was the God that they believed in. And they obviously, you know, didn't believe that he was telling them accurately. But here he's saying clearly that this being, this God who was talking to Moses, who brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, was the same person that was Christ in the flesh. So this is the first proof of seeing that Christ was the God of the Old Testament, the one who talked to, uh, you know, Moses, talked to Abraham, talked to others, is Christ declares that he is I am, the same I am that talked to Moses. The second proof uh, was actually written by the Apostle Paul. And so what it says is Paul, in his writings, declares that Christ was this rock of Israel. And so we can see again, and this is the interaction again between Moses and and the Lord, and this is in the Psalm of Moses. We see in Deuteronomy 32.3, it says, For I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. And then it goes on in verse 18, it says, Of the rock who begot you, so begot Israel, you are unmindful and have forgotten the God who has fathered you. So in here, Moses is saying this same God, this God who delivered him, the Lord, is also called the rock. And then we can turn to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1, and this is Paul writing. It says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. Then that rock was Christ. So here, Paul is plainly saying, right, this rock that the children of Israel sang about in the song of Moses, this rock that begot them, that brought them out of Egypt, was Christ that this was one and the same being, that they weren't separate beings. It's not someone outside of God the Father and Jesus Christ. It's not God the Father, but it was Christ, right? He was the being who was there with Moses, bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt. So that's the second proof, where Paul is saying clearly that this rock that the Israelites knew about was Christ. The third proof is that Christ declared that no one had seen the Father, but Moses in Exodus saw God in all of his glory, right? Saw just the backside of his glory, but actually saw him in the glory. So we'll turn to Exodus 33, verse 18, and breaking into a, a discussion between the Lord and Moses. And it's, and he, being Moses, said, please show me your glory. Then he said, being Christ, being the Lord, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I am gracious, and I I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is the place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. And so it shall be when my glory passes by that I will put you on the cliff of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back by my face shall not be seen. And then we know in John 1 verse 18, Christ declares that no one has seen the Father at any time. 
The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. Right, so we see here that Moses in Exodus actually saw God in his glory. Now, yes, he couldn't see the face of God, but he did see the backside of God, right? So if we take you know, these two scriptures or these two set of scriptures together, we can see clearly that this God who passed by Moses had to be the being Jesus Christ, right? Because Christ saw or that Moses saw this Lord or the Lord in all of his glory. And so, you know, people will argue that in other places that it was only a human form of God. And so when Moses and, and uh, or when, uh, you know, God would talk to Abraham or talk to Moses or come in other forms, that it wasn't really God in all of his glory. It wasn't God as a God being, but just God in a human form. But we see here in this one instance, at least, that God actually showed himself in his glory or the Lord showed himself in his glory to Moses, right? And if Christ is to be believed that no one has seen God the Father, then this being has to be Jesus Christ. All right, so we see from these just these three scriptures, and these are only a subset of ones that we could look at, we see clearly that Christ himself declares that he was the God that we see in the Old Testament. Right? Yes, there are references to God the Father in the Old Testament, and it's not that God the Father is not part of the Old Testament, but this being who is interacting with all of you know, the men and women that we know about, you know, talked with Adam and Eve, talked with Noah, talked with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? this God who spoke the Ten Commandments to the children of Israel, the one who came down at the dedication of Solomon's temple, right? this God was the pre-incarnate version, or the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, right? And we have Christ's own words declaring that they're one and the same being. So you might ask, you know, why is this important? Right? And the simplest answer is we're told to worship God in spirit and in truth, right? So we have a responsibility, even in these seemingly small matters, to study these core doctrines, to understand them, to search God's word, to see what God reveals the truth to be. Right? And we must then hold fast to the truth. So it's not just enough to have these truths, but we must hold on to them over time. Right? As I said earlier, even in the lifetime of the apostles, doctrinal errors were creeping into the church. Right? So people who would have heard it one way from the apostles, who heard the truth from the apostles, started to believe something else, you know, started to slowly drift away from this truth. Right? But in this case, also, the fact that Christ is the God of the Old Testament shows that there has to be unity between the teaching in the Old Testament, the law in the Old Testament, and what we're expected to do in the New Testament or as New Testament Christians. Right? So answering this question of who God of the Old Testament is helps us understand this relationship between the Old and New Testament, it helps us understand the relationship between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, and understand that they're not completely different. You know, it's not like Christ came to fix something that God the Father or this other being had done wrong. No, this is Christ continuing the plan that he and the Father had for all eternity. Right, so brethren, let's hold fast to these truths that we've been given. Let's make sure that we're refreshing even these seemingly simple truths that God has given us so that we can worship our God, our God who is worthy of worship in both spirit and in truth.